one well uh, good uh, morning everyone and as a president of bombay psychiatric society it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this panel uh, on why is the indian marriage on fire we have an elite powerful packed panel here today and i will just run through a very quick introduction of all of them because we don't want to waste too much time in detailed introductions so to start with we have uh, dr milan balakrishnan who is a consultant psychiatrist at uh, masina hospital he's also been past secretary of the bombay psychiatric society so we are very happy to have milan here we have dr fabian almeida who is a consultant psychiatrist from kalyan and also runs the wellsprings day care center and wellsprings clinic at kalyan Uh, we have Dr. Kiran Chandelia, who has her own private practice in Kandivali, and she's also an honorary consultant at the Department of Psychiatry, Sion Hospital. Uh, we have Dr. Cheryl John Central Nathan, who is a consultant psychiatrist at Holy Spirit Hospital, Hiranandani Pawai, and the treasurer of Bombay Psychiatric Society. Uh, we have uh, Mrs. Benaifa Saukar, who is uh, a senior psychologist who deals with couples. Uh, Uh, corporate related mental health issues and she's also on the panelist of uh, wirecom and uh, endemol so uh, we are very happy to have madam here we have a uh, sheena sood who is also a clinical psychologist and a counselor who is also attached to the hinduja hospital khar uh, we have mezabeen who works as a counseling psychologist at the hn alliance foundation hospital uh, we have Priya Day, who is a counselling psychologist for the past twelve years, and she works in my clinic, so it's the first panel I'm doing with her. So it's special to have her here, and we have uh, Prachi Tripathi, who has is a a clinical psychologist with a practice at Kandivili. She is looking a little dazed and tired, as she said, because she's had the inauguration of her clinic yesterday evening, which is the Reflect Within Center at Kandivili. So we welcome all of you uh, here today. and uh, well to start things off i mean i will uh, throw this question of course to milan and uh, fabian together uh, so we start with milan mm -hmm. and then fabian uh, how do you think the institution of marriage has changed over the years your thoughts yeah. the institution of marriage has definitely evolved and changed in the sense that i think uh, where it was uh, more more family driven to a more individual driven um, marriage in that sense um arranged marriages have been uh, are gradually being sort of replaced by more of uh, love come arranged marriages love marriages um more and more intercaste interreligious marriages that we see so uh, overall the institution has changed and as we discuss further i'm sure we'll a lot of other things will come up Oh, right fabian yeah, yeah I, i think with time the uh, institution of marriage has moved from a social construct or a social milestone to a much more personal construct uh, people are getting married for the reasons they want to get married not just because they have to get married and having said that i think there is much more freedom that has come in there is much more equality that has come in in the dynamics of a relationship there there's much more clarity uh, people know what they want and when they don't get what they want they are looking at options to either repair or to move forward and there's a lot more stock taking also now people want to make their marriages work they want their benefits from that marriage it's not like uh, now you are married and you live happily ever after i think those uh, narratives have changed and therefore i think this is good for us this is good for mental health and uh, it is a sign of uh, evolution for sure okay uh, i now move uh, of course uh, to benifer and uh, uh, prachi and i think the questions that i the same question i'm posing to both of you uh, what do you think in your experience as a psychologist that counsels couples you know constitutes a successful marriage or even a successful relationship for that matter i mean give us some factors or some points that you could say benifer ma'am first and then uh, prachi okay so i think that the foundation of marriage rests on four pillars there's love trust respect and space so you can't have one without the other you know it's like the wheels of a wagon it's just going to fall apart so um yeah so couples that respect each other and give each other space those are the marriages that work you know like literally be the in a very romantic sense be the wind beneath their wings 
because in this world of emancipation, you know, the people are changing, uh, gender boundaries are blurring, whether it's the boardroom, whether it is the bedroom, you know, we see that women are not afraid to say no, women are not afraid to say bus enough, they draw the lines. Men are not afraid to show their vulnerability. They cry. I have taken webinars, you know, with uh, industrial giants in the pandemic. And uh, men don't even switch off their camera when they're answering questions. And, you know, they're talking about whatever it is that is their distress. And uh, tears are running down their bearded cheeks. And I think that's fabulous. Right. Rachi. Uh, yes, I think uh, agreeing and adding on to what the Naifa ma'am has said, uh, I really feel that today successful relationships or marriages, uh, I think one major component that I have found is emotional availability to the partners. Emotional availability is something that we have seen uh, it does not sustain for a long term period. Having all these pillars in place, but not being emotionally available to your partner at the time of distress is something that, uh, you know, keeps on adding to the cracks in the relationship and over a period of time this emotional unavailability becomes a huge factor that each partner holds against each other so a very simple thing i think a very common example that i have seen is most women during pregnancy for example require too much of emotional availability and a lot of women go through postpartum at that time so i have seen that many uh, am i am i yeah uh, yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so I have seen that many women, you know, after the age is even 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the marriage, they hold on to the factor that, you know, at that time, my husband was not emotionally available to me. At that time, you know, this was not there. So I feel adding on to all the points with Banatha Nam has said, trust, respect, love, and of course, space, emotional availability at the right time of the marriage uh, or the relationship is, is, is of utmost importance. Uh, right. Uh, my question now to, of course, Cheryl and then uh, Kiran, we start with Cheryl first. Uh, why do you think as a psychiatrist that, you know, as a mental health professional, rather that we're seeing so many divorces happen? I mean, is it that uh, our tolerance has gone down or is it that, uh, you know, uh, uh, whereas earlier um, the whole concept of marriage has changed or the concept of a relationship has changed? So Cheryl first and then Kiran. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I think that we can you know carry forward from what uh, the previous two questions kind of went for what the, like because institutional marriages change uh, people are looking out for their individual needs and what am i getting out of this relationship uh, rather than staying bound to a relationship just because we are married you know so in some aspects maybe it's a good thing because that empowers somebody to leave an emotional less marriage or it, uh, you know, you're not compatible. Sometimes the philosophy of life is different. What you want from life is different. A lot of times we see couples um, not wanting to stay together because their parenting styles are different and there's a lot of conflict, you know, uh, regarding that. Uh, a lot of times you are empowered to leave the marriage when there is a lot of emotional, verbal, not just physical abuse. Physical abuse, uh, definitely, you know, people think twice and they would want to leave if they can. But even when there is emotional, verbal abuse, people want to leave. Um, financial incompatibility, uh, physical intimacy, the needs, both for women and men, if they're not met, that can be one of the reasons why marriage is failing. And like, you know, uh, many a times people just kind of earlier would suffer and say, it's okay, it's a, you know, we are not physically really intimate, but we just have to stick together. But now that physical need is also becoming a priority. Sometimes, even if all these things are going perfect, if communication is not really effective, if they're not able to communicate well with each other, uh, I think that's one of the reasons why divorce is on the rise. Kiran, yeah. yeah. I think it's very beautifully categorized what are the various causes of incompatibility in the marriage. I feel one of the reasons why divorce is happening is more because it is possible. Women are uh, have the financial ability to walk out of a marriage. They have the financial ability to say that if my husband is an alcoholic or beats me or I'm being ill-treated, this kind of an ability did not exist a couple. And we still see in cultures or socioeconomic strata where this ability is not there, then they do not have the decision-making power to be able to walk out of a marriage. So I think women's liberation in that sense has added a lot to it. The other thing is a change in the construct of what our expectations are from marriage. 
So let us say about 30 years ago, if a young girl was born, she was given the idea ki, beta, you will get married to a king and uh, you will live like a queen and you will have four sons and you will be treated with a lot of... Uh... So that was the idea that she grew up with. Today when a girl is born, then what happens is she's told, you first to you have to participate in the debate, you have to do dance mein achha karna hai. So essentially, the first construct was that you have to live for the greater good of the family. And today the construct is that you as an individual matter. What happens is the conflict is that the mother's, mother-in-laws of today belong to one generation before. And the daughter-in-laws are coming from this current generation. So the, there is an expectation gap more than there was in the past. So what I think is that is contributing. The sons are brought up with the idea that the woman will take care of me. And when they finally get into the marriage, so everybody has an expectation mismatch here, which is leading to, oh, this is not what I expected from a marriage in the first place. Or this is not what I was supposed to do. Because the minute a girl is told that, Beta, ab, apne baare mein bhool jo. now you have to decide, you have to give up for the family. It, it becomes difficult, even though it is necessary at times. Even though it is necessary, because how does the society run? So yeah. that is my take on it. Fine. <clears throat> well, um, uh, Mezabin and uh, Sagar, uh, the question which is there for you all is, I mean, many a times, I think five years ago, uh, you know, when anyone spoke of a live-in relationship, we had, you know, parents who would be up in arms and say, you know, in, in marriage, there is no trial and error before you, you know, go into marriage. You just get married and then be happy with what you get. But today we have a lot of couples who say, okay, we want to be in a live-in for two years or three years or to first see whether we are good enough. And then, so uh, as... Uh, uh, psychologists and, and the psychiatrists, of course, and both of you being unmarried. I mean, I'm just posing this to y'all. I mean, what is your take professionally, of course, also, and I mean, generally about live-in relationships? Mezabin first and then Sagar. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. So I think, I think in the recent years, there has been a very, very drastic change when it comes to relationships and it has been viewed very differently these days. So when we talk about a socio-cultural context, it was initially considered a taboo for men and women to live under the same roof without being legally married to each other. And also it premarital sex was something that was considered to be highly, highly immoral. But these beliefs are something that are gradually changing over a period of time, perhaps because of the freedom, privacy, even profession, education and overall globalization could be some of the factors that contribute greatly to such a change in mindset. So according to me, I think I think it has its own sets of pros as well as cons. Like if you were to look at the pros, we need to understand that when we are talking about a live-in relationship, it is very significantly different from just being in another relationship because the couples actually experience the fact of sharing the home together. So uh, one understands their likes, dislikes, about their habits, about whether they're compatible enough on many, many different levels or whether they share that kind of intimacy. So I think think it also gives a very good avenue to kind of understand what are the strengths and weaknesses of the relationship. On the other hand, when we look at it uh, from a disadvantage standpoint, the funda over here is that there are no obligations, there are no duties when we talk about a live-in relationship and sometimes it can provide as an easy way out. Now, when we're looking at an easy way out, uh, there is, of course, low commitment levels. The tolerance overall becomes less and less willingness to work. And statistically speaking, women are often more disadvantages in this kind of an equation when we're talking about a live-in relationship. So it can also lead to a lot of uh, logistic and day-to-day living wala problems. But if you kind of look at it from a bottom line perspective, or if you ask me my perspective, I think I think it is a very personal and a very subjective matter, which might work for some people, which might not work for some people. It has its own sets of negatives as well as positives. But I think like any other relationship, it also depends on the kind of people that are involved. So I think I think that's my take at this. <clears throat> yes, Sagar. Yeah. Uh, so coming to the, about the concept of living relationships, apna uh, jek advertisement hai tagline hai. Gadi detergent tikiya, pehle istemal kare, fir vishwas kare. 
नाउ घड़ी डिटर्जेंट को अगर आप इस्तेमाल करके टेस्ट करेंगे सो नाउ दिस इज द कंसेप्ट ऑफ अवर लाइफ और द कमिटमेंट फॉर योर होल लाइफ सो आई थिंक इट्स अ गुड कंसेप्ट दैट वी गेट अ ट्रायल ऑफ मैरिज लाइक कंडीशंस बिफोर मैरिज एंड द एडवांटेज ऑफ बीइंग इन लिव इन रिलेशनशिप इज दैट इट सपोज इट डजंट वर्क आउट एंड द कपल सेपरेट्स देयर इज नो स्टिग्मा ऑफ डिवोर्सी और स्टिग्मा ऑफ एंगेजमेंट ब्रोकन काइंड ऑफ थिंग बिकॉज़ दैट इज मच मोर uh seen badly in our society rather than he is out of the relationship so i think that is a big advantage and as mezabin said that uh, we can come to know about the physical compatibility emotional compatibility uh, when the guys are dating uh, he puts the best part uh, in front of the girls or in front of the couple but when they are living together the small small things like aaj show kaun sa dekhna hai tv ka Uh, the way he eats some people have got bad habit of making noise while eating and that the couple might not like and he says are bap re shaadi se pehle aisa kyun nahi dekha maine yeah so that's that small small things uh, she can get used to or they can make some arrangements for it so that is the advantage uh, coming to disadvantages as we say there is no legal status or no legal protection for the living partners uh, in case uh, the couple uh, the pregnancy occurs uh, in the couple and then what the, about the child what is the legal status so these are some disadvantages or it can be an easy way of like a licensed uh, having sexual relationship in a couple so that can be a misused part in the living relationships that's my take okay uh, i now move to uh, priya and uh, sheena sood and uh, my my query to you all is that uh, we have a lot of marriages where we see um, couples are living apart they are long distance so there are couples that one partner is here and one partner is abroad and we have seen many of these marriages work we have also seen many of them not work so uh, starting with priya and then sheena what do you think you know other factors that sort of determine success as well as failure in a long distance kind of marriage where one partner a is either away for years or he could be on a ship he's away for some months comes back you know that kind of a situation yeah right uh i'll uh, begin with why indian marriages are going down hill due to this aspect since that's the subject of our discussion here we'll begin there uh indians are uh, traditionally uh used to working in a joint family setup uh where in you know marriages earlier thrived with the support of the extended family and today most families having gone uh, most couples having gone nuclear in the scenario where in uh, the, uh, the extended family is somewhere in their hometown or even if they they are in the same city they probably not in the vicinity to uh, double up as support uh, in this scenario if one spouse is away for days or for months there is bound to be an emotional or a physical impact on both the spouses and hence uh, of course on the marriage because as human beings we are all hardwired uh, to dislike separation and the reason why we get together with someone in in a uh, relationship like marriage is to be together and this purpose is not solved if one or either or either or both partners are traveling uh, <clears throat> a few physical uh, the physical toll uh, that can happen on a person is actually their immune systems getting weak severe exhaustion or uh, taking over due to extensive travel maybe like you uh, mentioned sir on a ship or even uh, staying abroad for years uh, is bound to take a toll on the marriage uh, it and this does not just impact the traveling partner but it also negatively impacts the family back at home wherein he's low, he or she is low on energy and won't be able to spend that kind of uh, time with the partner or the family or uh, if children are involved in this uh, of course then there is uh, the entire gamut of missing on important milestones or uh, like birthdays school events of course marriage anniversaries and uh, many such other uh, important events and milestones uh, that the couple share that can again have a negative impact on the relationship um another one important pertinent aspect is uh, if when the traveling partner is away the same partner he or she has devised her own framework and has put his or her own processes in place for the family for the children and for the day to day operational and the transactional aspect and uh, once the traveling partner is back there is this whole stir up and shifting that uh, that suddenly is warranted and this kind of reintegration again can take a toll on uh, both partners you know trying to again shift back to the earlier way of being and the earlier mode of operation and so on and so forth and that can kind of ruffle the entire dynamics uh, in the marriage and have an impact yeah. uh, on it yeah 
Okay, Sheena, yeah, you'll have to unmute, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, Priya ma'am has uh, told us about the cons very well. I would like to talk about the pros. So there are uh, some aspects that I think uh, where just two things work, understanding and communication. So the only pros of a long distance relationship would be if you have understanding and communication in the right place. Uh, so there are couples that I have seen and met who uh, like their partners being away and this kind of a uh, arrangement works for them so because they have already understood that this is my kind of life and that is your kind of life so if you interfere into my life like the everyday couples we are only going to fight so this uh, understanding and communication has happened so this is a pro to some people who are uh, in agreement with such an arrangement of long distance relationships for them daily new uh, things like a wife constantly cooking for their husband or taking care of children won't work. They want a relationship that is different. Maybe she has her own profession and the husband has his own profession. So I think communication and understanding is the uh, what makes long distance relationships work, according to me. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I will now, of course, go back to Milan and uh, I will also pose this question at the same time to um, uh, Fabian, and uh, then I will just open it a little to uh, others. Uh, there are so many online matrimonial sites, you know, which are there today, and uh, they made it look that it's so easy to get married, you know. So uh, the thing is, do you think online matrimonial sites are uh, a boon or a bane? Because <clears throat> they've they've come on more powerful, I think, and in the COVID period, it's become all the more powerful. So Milan first, and then Fabian, yeah. Yeah, uh, online matrimony sites definitely have their advantages because you uh, sort of are looking at one a larger spectrum. Otherwise, earlier uh, people would look at uh, narrower spectrums where they would look within people who know people, etc. You so the matrimony sites definitely open up a much wider spectrum. And also, it gives you sort of a uh, a pre matching in a lot of ways. You know, a lot of uh, at least uh, socio cultural. Uh, educational backgrounds, etc., et definitely can be uh, matched better. A lot of things uh, can be sort of pre-matched, and also gives gives opportunity from from there on to even get to know the person. I think the major con is now that there is actually a lot of conning happening on these sites. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, scamsters out there, and there's lots of uh, cheating happening. So I think that's one one thing that's created a, a definite mess now. Yeah, Fabian. Uh, I think we live in an age where we have a Zomato, we have Uber Eats, we have Swiggy and now Swiggy Jenny. So if that can help us in the fact that we are so busy and tied up with time, why not help us be, make informed choices with such websites? But like Milan rightly pointed out, there is some onus that we need to take before we jump onto that bandwagon. I think it helps you filter your search. And for those who are lethargic, I think it's doing the same thing that your mom and dad and uh, overindulgent aunts and uncles would do for you through this medium. But having said that, uh, it is very important to have a fact check and a reality check. That is very, very important. You need to know your background well because every there's Photoshop and there's a, a someone who's done one year course becomes an engineer, someone who's dabbed a little with words becomes a literature specialist. So you have to do your fact check, get your reality check done. And uh, having said that also, uh, look before you leap, that is important. And I guess invest before you reap. So take that time out for the coffee, go to a movie together, see your comfort level. And if you are destined to meet this way, then why not? but don't repent at leisure. Right. Uh, this is a question uh, for Mezabin and uh, Cheryl. And um, uh, that, you know, in, in your practice over time, I mean, uh, maybe Cheryl first and then, then Mezabin. What, what I would suggest is, what do you think about, you know, um, intercaste and interreligious marriages and you know do uh, they have their boons and bains and uh, and i mean i will i will just share a very small anecdote because my my mother was south indian hindu and my dad was christian roman catholic and they told me that 
in this they got married in 1972 and when they did people from my mother's community didn't speak to her you know for like 3 or 4 months because she was a brahman girl who was marrying a christian who eats meat i mean of course we are far beyond that today but the thing is uh, so you know w- does it work does it not work sheril first and then yeah so you know it's great that you gave your example i'll give mine so i am a born and raised christian married to a tamilian hindu and you know it was really funny because today my kids were asking you know about you know how it was and it must have been cool to get married like that and we belong to two different states for always at war with each other that's kerala and tamil nadu you know so i can <laughs> you know get your uh, parent situation quite easily yeah but we do see um, a lot of intercaste interreligious marriages i know the current scenario sometimes doesn't encourage it a lot now but um, i think what is required for a successful marriage in that situation especially when intercaste interreligion comes into play is a maturity of the individuals are getting into that relationship because if uh, they are not mature enough to understand you know uh, what religion means to the other person then there are problems you know um so also a basic understanding of each other's religion and cultures uh, it's very easy for us to you know pass night comments or you know put down the other person's religion which really impacts the marriage it could be just said out of jest because we usually say a lot of things out of jest but in a marriage uh, which comes from people from two different religions or communities i think it's very important to be observant of what you're saying and you know how much are you handling it many times individuals who have a lot of faith and you know religious upbringing uh, when they get into a marriage i think with a person of another religion they also face a lot of separation guilt and anxiety about am i giving up my religion do i have to kind of you know follow another culture and i think it is the onus of the other partner to kind of you know or i think a very detailed discussion about this before marriage is extremely important because sometimes people do not discuss this so when you're getting into a marriage like this you have to discuss i mean what does it mean for me forward do i have to give up my religion do i have to follow uh, the religion of the other partner what religion are the children going to follow do we agree that they're going to be told about both the religions do we agree that they're going to follow one religion whatever works for the couple without getting the families involved i think before they get anybody else involved there should be a very very clear understanding between the couple about these practical aspects because as the kids grow up it's important to teach them you know tolerance towards the other religion i mean every couple is different so some people can choose to uh, i remember reading a very nice article i think about sharuk about why he named his the younger son abram and how they try to kind of have a secular environment at home and you know tolerance so i think that kind of an encouragement where you talk about both religions when you are bringing up your children is extremely important so i think tolerance and respect for each other's religion will make it go in a long way yeah as i mean um right so uh, i think i think dr sheril put it very very beautifully that uh, no uh, the more communication the more open communication the better it is because caste and religion are very very integral components of our society especially if you're looking at an indian society and marriages within the same caste same religion are somewhat of a norm that we see usually a lot of it has got to do with preconceived societal values and for the longest part having a uh, different people from different religions marrying each other was kind of an unacceptable proposition and i can i can vouch for it coming from a parsi family that the pressure is real so going further when we when we talk about uh, couples within an intercaste marriage i think the most common problem that a couple would probably face would be a uh, they would they would confront a stern parental disapproval societal criticism and sometimes even being ostracized from the community and it becomes very very difficult for this kind of a couple to adjust with family and you know it opens many many other doorways for different kind of other conflicts if we were to look at it from a psychological standpoint i think psychologically an intercaste marriage can be very exhausting since both partners have to sacrifice so much to be together there is also a little bit of a struggle in terms of realistically setting and managing their expectations within a relationship of course lifestyle differences also kind of contribute to difficulty in coping 
Besides that, having constantly to struggle and be there for each other can also take a toll on the relationship overall. And if an intercaste couple is unable to somehow live up to the expectations of each other, then the couple is bound to have regret their decisions and blame each other. As a result, they get more frustrated, remain unhappy. Along with that, if we couple the baggage of having given up so much can further compound the unhappiness, making the marriage very rocky and very uncomfortable in certain areas. But if you were to ask me, are interca- intercaste marriages successful? Of course, of course, they are absolutely successful. And we have many, many examples in the mainstream media. And I'm sure all of us know at least a few couples like that around us. However, given the societal structure, if you were to look at it, an intercaste couple typically has to face more challenges as compared to the ones which are more mainstream, like the ones which marry within their caste. And like Dr. Cheryl said, it requires a lot of maturity, understanding, and perhaps effort and patience from both the partners involved and conversation and constant communication to make the marriage work. So I think, I think that's my understanding of whether they work or not. Oh, well, my question to Kiran and Prachi, starting with, of course, Kiran first and then Prachi, is that uh, we're seeing now more and more the concept of an open marriage, you know, where both partners are given the freedom to do what they want, while the partners remain together when it comes to family issues or the kids, but otherwise they're having their own relationships outside and a lot of things are happening. So as a mental health professional, I mean, what is your viewpoint or take on open marriages? So I think uh, open marriage in itself is a very, very mature idea, provided that the individuals who are are participating in an open marriage concept are both ready and both equally mature to handle it. Essentially, what happens is that one partner says that this is the way it's going to be, and you accept it or leave it. And the other partner is forced to accept the situation, and there's a lot of built-up resentment with it. Also, the freedom actually belongs to just one partner, who is the decision maker, who is the... But I think if we have that level of openness where people are together for... Because marriages in India are families uniting. Let us say somebody in their 40s is taking care of their children. They're also taking care of their elderly parents. And at that point of time to say that, hello, this marriage doesn't work for me also means that the entire framework of everything gets moved. So in order to keep the framework intact and yet have your own individuality, I think it's a great idea. But but the whole thing is it doesn't go the way it is kept in theory. A lot of people come back with uh, feeling used, depressed. And uh, so one person has affairs and says, so essentially what I've seen is that one person lands up having affairs. And when it comes out in the open, he says, this is the way it's going to be. You accept and let's have an open marriage. And the other person is not ready. So that's my feeling. Okay. Uh, Prachi. Um, that, that was a really uh, good and elaborate uh, you know, explanation. Uh, I am seeing definitely a rise in open marriages. And uh, the uh, lot of open marriages, they begin with uh, you know ideal concepts that it's going to be very rosy, it's going to be very free and a lot of things. But uh, I have seen that many people then start having insecurities, then they expect some sort of commitment when they grow closer and then again, it doesn't work out. Uh, But very few, but yes, definitely more mature people who are not insecure as individuals in themselves, who have a very different concept of marriage, uh, which is not only in context to physical intimacy, not possessing each other, not owning each other as such. I feel these individuals have been the ones who have been able to sustain open marriages uh, as compared to individuals who have actually, they believe, they think that they are pro for open marriage, but moving down further, they realize that no, they, they need commitment. They need some sort of a label for it to be accepted. That label per se more because they feel insecure about their partner. So um, I feel uh, uh, after getting into marriage and uh, having a marital affair, uh, extramarital affair, and then announcing it as an open marriage uh, definitely is a 
it's a trauma to the other partner it's a devastation of you know uh, individual uh, each individual uh, uh, you know uh, emotional growth uh, they being as partners so uh, i i really feel the stark opposing concepts they need to come down to a certain point and as therapists we need uh, probably we, we play a major role in making them understand where you know what are the pros and cons of each for that matter so i guess after marriages it is to take a probably the other partner is not left with a choice and that is not called as an open marriage uh, that is that is definitely not an open marriage and uh, when it's prior to marriage of course it's an informed decision and both uh, own the responsibility of dealing with the damages that they go through right so, yeah. uh, my my question now to benifer and sheena is that uh, uh, does age difference between you know two partners in a marriage matter because uh, there is one there have been people i know one school of thought who says that okay if the age difference is around 2 3 years or 4 years it's better and you know if it's the same whereas there are we've seen innumerable marriages where there have been age differences of even 8 years and 10 years and the marriages have worked so uh, starting with benifer and then sheena do you think age really matters in a marriage or you know, the age difference plays any role i think if it is if you've selected your partner versus an arranged marriage you know there are greater chances because out of you know the operator word is free will out of free will and choice you have signed on the dotted line so obviously there was some index of compatibility and some check boxes that the person ticked and as you said there are numerous examples you know i mean you take the french president you take priyanka chopra you know i mean where it's the sex doesn't matter it's the compatibility that really matters yeah sheena yeah so i think i agree with ma'am and also what matters is uh, the kind of person you want to marry so he could be 20 years older to you but uh, he matches uh, your you understands you he matches the needs and understands how you want to function what profession you are in is understandable to him your working times are understandable to him and similarly for the other gender so the understanding again is very important and if that is between somebody who's very old or very uh, young as compared to your age it's fine so i think the understanding matters yes okay uh, my question to uh, uh, priya and sagar starting with sagar and then priya is that now we are seeing more and more people who are getting married later you know compared to earlier so earlier i mean the thought was that by the time you are 25 or 26 you should be married off you will have stability in your life and uh, that has led to of course we've had a lot of divorces happen and people come up to us in our clinics and say that you know now i'm 33 and i actually realize what i want you know in a relationship and i'm more mature and i so there are more and more people who are opting to get married post 33 35 so you know what is your take on that i mean does is is that the right approach is that what works so priya first and then sagar yeah thank you sir <clears throat> am i audible yeah um uh, we talking of late marriages that's uh, over 33 and 35 uh the the good side of it is that individuals are who get into this or subscribe to uh, this kind of marriage they are more mature they are independent and they come with a share of life experiences and they have a lot to bring to the table uh for each other and towards this a collective uh cause of marriage uh so in that sense uh, it works for people who have these uh, virtues and values and uh, you know who can make best of it but since we're talking about indian marriages being on fire so i will uh, go uh, you know try and shed some light on the pitfalls of uh, the late marriages in uh, today's time uh the reverse side of this is uh there are a lot of excess baggage expectations and egos that come into play in late marriages mm-hmm. so because there is this uh, gender demographic uh, shift that has happened uh, in recent times uh you know people want financial independence uh before they uh tie themselves down to the commitment uh and hence uh, of course that's going to have an adverse impact on uh, the marriage uh, a few reasons could be uh one of the reasons is when uh, someone gets into a late marriage kind of an arrangement uh, the honeymoon period per se is already over now here i'm talking about people who are shifting from the live in to the uh, you know and then embarking upon uh, the journey of marriage uh, on the marital journey 
here the honeymoon and all of that experimentation is already done with so there is just the transactional and the operational bit that they have to deal with once they're married that kind of has an impact on the marriage then both adults here having strong opinions opinionated minds not ready to uh, change not ready you know very rigid uh, mindsets uh, when they uh, come together that's one of the reasons uh, there is a lack of zeal and enthusiasm uh, once uh, they reach 33 and 35 as against as opposed to couples who have tied the knot in their 20s uh, when there is you know there is the support of youth and uh, zeal uh, <clears throat> another thing is there is not enough time spent together in late marriages before the rush for kids and the pressure of uh, women conceiving especially in the indian context uh, that tends to kick start so before they can really enjoy the fruits of togetherness and companionship there is this pressure of you know going down the family way um that apart financial priorities both uh, have i'm sure uh, at that point by 35 they're all financially independent they have their own frameworks of uh, what finances mean and what prudence means and they when they come together they may not be able to, both partners may not be able to converge uh, in the true sense uh, with a, as far as the financial goals and uh, vision is concerned so these are a few of uh, the reasons why and of course the odd one out syndrome wherein everyone their age at that point are married they have children school going kids and the couple here have just embarked upon the journey of uh, marriage that again puts an added pressure uh, on marriages uh, yeah these would be a few yes. uh, of my points yeah sagar yeah <clears throat> yeah uh, coming to the ideal age of marriage now i'll just uh, speak first about the early uh, advantages of marrying at an early age now if a uh, person is marrying at a right early age uh, it's a well have she, she has got more time he or she has got more time to adapt to the new conditions new commitments and uh, every other responsibilities but as we grow older sagar uh, sorry we, to interrupt you what do you mean by right early age uh, means <clears throat> if the someone marries at at the age of 22 23 24 uh, he is not having his own ideas or his own uh, rules of how to live the life uh, strongly she can mm-hmm. or he can modulate himself or herself as, as per the situations uh, any new conditions or anything new they are very much adaptive to these things uh, if the partner loses the job all of sudden uh, at the age of 24 they have sufficient time to uh, uh, look for the new opportunities and all but if the same thing happens at the age of 35 he loses the job or something and he is just married now see at the age of 35 finding a new job Uh, finding new responsibilities will be an additional burden to him uh, apart from that uh, at the age of 35 the husband or the wife will not have an elderly parents to take care of the grandchildren now this is the very important part if you are marrying young having kids at an early age you have got a good social support if any problems happen uh, husband has to go out of uh, country or something there are grandparents to take care and nurture the children so good nurturing also happens at an early age of marriage so that's the advantage okay fine uh would any of our panelists want to add anything to you know the questions that you have not been asked if there's anything Can that I just you, yes, add yes, something yes 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 when you talk yes. about late marriage you know i had yeah. a big grin on my face when you said 33 35 because that's the norm with parsis and that if you marry <laughs> by 33 35 you would not be becoming extinct okay so i'm just wondering that if we were to push it a little more what about second innings what about senior citizens you know who find love rather late like after they become widowed after they have you know the kids have flown out of the nest i mean today even in senior citizen homes we have people 75 80 falling in love getting married and it's not about sex it's just about having that warm body you know to cuddle in bed to have conversations just to hold your hand i think so we also need to look at that i don't think love has an expiration date yeah kiran yeah you wanted to add something yeah i wanted to add about that uh, internet uh, seeing her matrimonial sites yeah yeah okay so just two points one is the attitude with which people are there on the matrimonial sites in the previous times when when somebody would visit you or you would visit another person for an arranged marriage if everything was all right and normal most people would say yes and then that would be the done thing here you're looking 
as though you're not looking for a life partner, but you're looking at a market or a restaurant and you're trying to see what is good and what is not good. So uh, that is one problem. People are constantly looking for a better option. So it becomes an official multiple dating, an official hookup site with parental approval, all right, go ahead. And therefore it becomes very heavy grounds for emotional abuse, sexual abuse, everything. What, where I find it exceptionally good is where people, divorced people are looking for marriages. People, single mothers are looking for a partner. People with HIV positive, people with mental illnesses where they want to say that I have a mental illness and I want to get married. And you know, this is where I feel that the internet provides opportunities that were not available before this. So I think that right. is a very big advantage. Right, right, right. Yeah, that brings us to an important question, which I'll pose to Fabian and Milan with Fabian going first this time. The thing is that uh, when we look at marriage and we see so much of psychopathology, I'm sure all of us have come across cases where the girl has been, you know, had an illness when she was unmarried. She's gotten married without the relatives of the husband or the husband's family knowing. And then, you know, the illness aggravates and then, you know, they come to us and, and we've been treating them prior to marriage. But then they want us not to tell the husband and not to tell the husband's family that, you know, uh, whatever. So, and we have to, they tell us you pretend it's the first time, you know, we're coming to you, that kind of a thing. So that does happen. So one is that, uh, and as much as we tell them, don't hide, don't hide. We also know if they don't hide, they won't find a guy. I mean, that also will happen. So the issue is what, what should, you know, we, we are take in in these situations and and the psychopathology aggravate or does it get protected you know with with marriage i mean as such yes you've outlined the beaten track really well we all go through these situations and we sometimes we are tongue-tied we don't know what to do after having spelt out everything uh, before the marriage uh, sometimes what i do is i think a little bit of uh, white lies where you don't really ask them to define what exactly was the psychopathology, but bring the psychiatrist in the picture, bring medication, treatment, and something to do with mental health so that they are a little sensitive about this aspect of the person to be married. Uh, one of the most, and uh, having people like Deepika Padukone, et cetera, having gone through depression, depression is somehow the most welcome aspect of psychopathology among people. So when you say that they have gone through problems, they have taken treatment and they have seen a, a psychiatrist, you've done half your journey covered. Not everybody may understand the intricacies of a psychotic depression, or something else to do with it. So a little easier that path. And then finally, uh, when people come through with the problem after marriage, I think with the fear of sounding cliche, it is love that conquers all. If we try to equip people with the fact that, you know, incidentally, this could have happened to you, this could have happened after marriage to anyone. And when your vows do outline that we take each other for better or for worse in goodness or in bad, in health, in, in sickness, I think that is the testing time for the partner. And therefore, we don't just let the partner deal with this problem alone. What we need to do is give as much as support in terms of information, understanding, hands-on aspects, support groups, et cetera, for the partner dealing with this situation. So once that is done, I think the partner feels empowered because we're not talking about uh, something like a heart ailment, or we're not talking about something like uh, asthma or something, but we are talking about the mind, mental health, which is, let's say, eventually, even among the educated, not completely understood, decoded or outlined. So providing this support to that partner so that it's an uh, easier journey forward, I think that is what we definitely need to do to help the situation and ease the problems at hand. Right. Uh, my my next question is uh, to Benifer and Cheryl. And uh, I mean, I you're Milan did oh, not sorry, Milan, Milan, Milan is left. Sorry, sorry, Milan is left. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Milan. Yes, Fabian, sir. well said, huh? very well articulated. Yes. Right. So about this whole situation that we face, uh, where we see patients with uh, who, who get married and we, we've told them umpteen times that, you know, uh, you should discuss it fully. But we get both uh, uh, ends of the spectrum, right? We have uh, times when uh, before marriage, the, the would-be partner comes in, speaks to us, 
has a, has an open conversation we discuss the pros and cons of the of the of the sort of marriage and and what treatment the partner may require or continue to require or what kind of support uh, he or she may need and this uh, sometimes this sort of clear discussion does happen and then even post marriage they continue to sort of follow up as uh, as a sort of team as a, as a couple uh, so i think that uh, that also does happen we see that also happen often i think also something that we uh, with the uh, with sort of more uh, in in the sense more severe mental illness like bipolar schizophrenia somehow uh, partners tend, tend to be more more supportive i think the gray area comes where we talk about personality disorders uh, where uh, there is a lot of uh, like this with with borderline personality or there's risk of suicide self harm where uh, partners do tend to get uh, very hassled and uh, find it very difficult to deal with things and uh, with with personality disorders that for them the sort of uh, uh, line gets a little blurred between between mental illness and personality and what what is it what is it that we're dealing with so i think uh, despite a lot of a uh, lot of support counseling the the partners do tend to sort of uh, not be able to deal with it uh, and a uh, lot of lot of divorces tend to happen on on that ground mute Sorry, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, I my my next question to Benifer and Cheryl is because you know um, there is this old adage that you know used to say that a marriage happens not between two people but but two families. So you know, what do you think about this in today's scenario? Because very often we get people in the clinic who come to us, and you know, the wife or the husband is sitting in front of us and says, you know, I am not, you know. got married to him to look after his ailing parent or not got married to you know look after a brother who has developmental disabilities i mean that was not part of my uh, package or agreement you know in the marriage why should i have to bear all this whereas in the olden times the thought was you know you marry the family whatever happens in the family you you go with it you look after it so your take uh, first uh, cheryl and then benifer yeah yeah so uh, i think if, if goes something like to what uh, you know when kiran was talking about how the construct of marriage has changed you know earlier it was a given that you know when you're getting married you're going to kind of both the people and i think more onus on the women unfortunately to take care of the husband's family and not uh, vice versa i think things are changing that way that you know even the girl because there's so many single girl children who are getting married and they also feel that they need to take responsibility of their families um even if we have moved from a joint family to a nuclear family setup in our indian context uh, at least the current generation has to take you know uh, sometimes willingly and sometimes unwillingly responsibility of their families so it's not always only about individuals it's about families sometimes always when we have you know um, couples who come in uh with issues and then they talk about a mother in law or a father in law is creating a problem and i ask them okay do they stay with you and they say no no they are far away in rajasthan and uh, they don't even stay with them they kind of you know meet them probably once in two years when they go for a holiday for 10 days but they're so omnipresent every day in their day to day lives so i always say ye patni patni and wo is usually sometimes that wo is a family not even another person so even if your families are not living with us by you know our own uh, value systems belief systems which we bring in from our family families are a extremely intricate part of marriage even if they are not part of our living setup we do bring in you know the same cultural things the same uh, you know things the way we react to a particular situation the food that we want to eat so families are definitely according to me a very intricate part of our marriage system uh benifer yeah yeah so cheryl has very beautifully encapsulated the shouldering of the responsibilities part and the remote control access good job cheryl but i just want to tell you a little bit about how it even screws up things in the counseling office you know because you have so many players like when we are making notes i'm like man there is a kaka and there's a mama and there's a nephew and everybody is adding their 
uh, two bits and it's such a bhelpuri, you know. So you go in with the first session and you think like, wow, well done, you know, it went really, really well. And they were very civil, very cordial and they say, aha, I accept my mistake, I goofed up here. Second session, they are like this, you know, and you're wondering like, what went wrong? Why? Because they went back, there was a replay, there was a micro analysis of what happened in the session. Everybody is adding absolutely conflicting East-West views and, you know, it's, it's just falling apart. So like whatever damage control you did, whatever uh, effort to be the fevicol, the cohesive force you tried, it just kind of falls apart with all these people. So with very dogged determination, you know, we have to compartmentalize and say, hey, you guys, if you are coming here for counseling, just see yourself in two boxes, the husband, the wife, just try and stay detached, easier said than done. Right. Uh, my next question is to Prachi and then to uh, Kiran. Well, uh, Prachi will leave us after this panel. She has an urgent family engagement that she has to look after, but she will answer this question and go. Uh, does we get many couples that are brought to us, you know, ki, sir, ye ladka hai, ye ladki hai, they want to get married. Abhi aap hi kuch unka test karo, kuch karo, bolo ki matlab shadi chalega ya nahi. Very often, you know, we have, as though we are going to be people who can, you know, know everything. So does pre, and they say premarital counseling aap karo. And, you know, because people have caught on to the term and there are many, many counselors who do advertise that we do premarital counseling. So does premarital counseling play any role? Prachi first, then you can run away and then Kiran. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, I feel uh, now uh, with the times changing, there are a lot of people uh, and a lot of families who are gracefully accepting premarital counseling. Uh, I feel I have recently seen so many families who have said that Pandit ji apna bol denge, pehle aap apna bataye ki hum kya workout kar sakte hai. Like kundlis and all are different, but then they get stuck to a point ki agar karna hi hai, then is there a way out? Pandit ji would say, havan karao, ye karao, but then they have actually gone further and they have analyzed that if the two people can learn adapting with each other. So yes, definitely premarital counseling helps them a lot. One major question that I come, uh, that I usually ask them in premarital counseling sessions is if they are willing to accept their partners the way they are. If they do not have anything to change in their partners, are they going to be okay with that? Because the major part of premarital is families say ki aage ja ke sab kuch just ho jayega. Wo sab chanta nahi hai. Matlab wo ho jayega. But are those partners willing to accept each other completely? Are they prepared mentally to radically accept the situations that are going to come forward with the difficulties that each partners are going to come ahead with? So probably uh, putting forth this in front of them and they evaluating it in that manner uh, helps them understand a lot. And there have been professionals who have decided mutually that this is not going to work it at all because they have an instinct, but family pressure ki wajah se wo kuch bol nahi pa rahe hain, na nahi bol pa rahe hain. So when we put it for on the table and when they are actually looking at it objectively as to how two people are extremely different and how much they are not willing to adjust and compromise for each other, probably I think that that becomes a huge decision making uh, aspect for them. <laughs> Because a lot of people refrain from, uh, you know, getting divorced post marriage. They do not want to have those labels. So yes, I feel premarital counseling helps uh, a lot. Thank you. Once I have just one small thing to just ask you, since you will be going, then Kiran can of course add uh, to all that you said. You know, if say you do some assessment, and you know, and of course clinically, when we interview people over time, you know, we know that there is a personality issue may not be a personality disorder, but we find there is some cluster B trait. So there's some narcissistic trait, you know, do you ever warn the other partner, you know, ki bas ye sab hai, baad mein problem ho sakta hai, you know, I mean, Pele, I have told you, don't come back to me later and say that, you know, I didn't tell you. Uh, not that I didn't tell you, but I, uh, yes, we carry out personality assessments uh, when people come in for marital counseling, as well as when people come for pre-marital, uh, because they want an objective understanding of their partners. So we do, uh, you know, tell them that these are certain difficult areas. It is not more of a, just a warning, but we tell them that there is a solution to it if you work on it together. 
so i think but it is fair enough to say each other that these are the difficulties and probably say for example it is a narcissistic partner and the other partner is very much emotional in nature and you know needs that kind of an emotional support uh, it is going to be a challenge for that partner to not receive that kind of empathy from from the spouse right right it is going to be a huge point but if it is uh, for example any other illness like plus to be traits then uh, then the person who is uh, you know looking forward to living in a family looking forward to having major adjustments from that partner it is going to be a challenge for them right so mm-hmm. definitely understanding what are their future plans and how they look forward to uh, creating a future together it is fair enough to put forward their whatever their original results are and so that they can make an informed choice that is exactly what they are for in premarital counseling so i believe yes, yes i would do that well okay thank you prachi and you can i mean go off so the yeah kiran thank please you. please carry on thank yeah. you so much yeah um, personally i'm a fan of premarital counseling i feel that uh, in marriage people are just thrown into the water and us to just stay afloat and do whatever you know but essentially there is so much in a marriage like for example there's responsibility sharing there is financial sharing there's intellectual sharing there is sharing at the level of emotions there is so much that a couple doesn't know when they're getting into marriage they think it's only romance half of the ideas of marriage have been turned on by bollywood or netflix or whatever and they think that is what marriage is about so i think a little communication to preempt that see this is what is going to happen also uh, the counselor can then be a facilitator for example talking about finances that you are getting in so much money you are getting in so much money these are the overheads and this is how it's going to be divided i think a conversation about contraception who's going to be take the responsibility for contraception premarital counseling is especially helpful when one person has a known mental illness and understanding how to communicate with this person how to support this person when to read signs of the illness coming back again not to panic not to assume that this person is acting nasty on their own accord this may be a aggravation of the illness uh, i think that becomes very very important and also a lot of people cannot be assertive enough when they are initially talking about one is they want to get married but at the same time if they're too assertive they feel to fizzle out so i think a counselor can then do that part of being assertive that this is how it should be Oh, this is how this person wants it to be so i think it's a very very good exercise all right uh well my next question is of course to uh mehzabeen and uh um sagar that i mean with the increase in divorces which have happened today i mean i'm posing a statement to you and i want your view on it is it that partners have become less accommodating or they've become more assertive Yeah, yeah, Mazabi. First, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's a very interesting statement. So recently, I came across a very interesting statistic that said that India has the lowest divorce rates in the world, which is roughly one percent, which is according to recent surveys and reports. So on the face of it, it looks like a very heartening story, isn't it? But people. like people are very happily married etc cetera, etc cetera. but the caveat over here is that most often that's not the case so the statistics are grossly skewed the rise in number of these quick divorces is perhaps an indication of changing in the attitudes and perceptions that have started to take shape in the recent times if we were to look at it from a metropolitan side the present reality is that more and more young couples in major cities are actually willing to end a marriage if it's not working now there could be many different reasons for it perhaps an impulse wedding the waning influences of a joint family perhaps the growing independence of women lack of emotional compa- compatibility domestic violence lack of communication lots and lots of different things like perhaps a work schedule disagreement based on social behavior or monetary disagreements but the overall funda these days is when we, the, there used to be an attitude that if nothing else stay in for the children that does not seem to be a very common sentiment anymore especially when we're looking at looking at it from the perspective of the rise of autonomy in women until very recently i would say the ability to dissolve a marriage was a privilege that most indian women did not have and the reasons are both social as well as domestic 
a staggering number of Indian middle-aged women are not financially independent, which limits their options severely. And also, there is also an attached stigma of being a divorcee. However, with these changes in attitudes and perceptions, the perception about divorce has also changed drastically. And more and more women are also independent financially. So I think I think to sum it up with these changes, the dynamics between the partners have changed. The relationship today are more geared toward perhaps equality and respect rather than one based on power and control. So which brings both the partners to being more assertive rather than one being dominant and one being submissive or overly accommodating. So I think I think to sum it up very, very briefly, <laughs> I think I think the assertiveness factor, I think, is a more bigger contributor. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, as we all know that the divorce rates are al- rising. I mean, the first point is now that society has become more acceptable. Uh, in the past, uh, if the person uh, just submits his application for divorce, everyone will try to counsel, right from the family members uh, to the lawyers or the marital counsel, everyone said, no, you should not go for divorce. But now the family is supportive. They say, if you have a girl, you should have a girl, you should have a Now, the more acceptance uh, towards divorce. And uh, there are more number of divorce lawyers than the uh, other kinds of lawyers. So I think that is the one thing which is a major contributor. Second, uh, rising in the... Uh, mental stress. Uh, I'm not telling mental disorders or mental illnesses. There are a lot of stress uh, in nowadays, a lot of expectation from the couple. And as I said previously, also lack of social support or the family support. Uh, there are this only husband and wife staying, a lot of responsibilities are, uh, is there on their shoulders and uh, leading to a lot of tension and the stress. Now, in the olden days, if there is some minor rift, uh, the father-in-law or the mother-in-law would intervene and they would just uh, settle the issue between them. But now no elders around, no one is there to settle and they will go to their friends. Now friend is equally frustrated and she will also uh, add on to her uh, problems and say, yes, yes, better to get off this uh, relationship. So that's why there is higher rates of divorce. That's my take. So there are less accommodative couples nowadays rather than more assertiveness. Okay. Uh, my, my last uh, question to, of course, uh, Priya and Sheena, and then we will just have a quick round with all of you brief round before we end this panel is we're seeing a lot of divorces happen after 20 plus years of marriage now. And, uh, and many a times I know the couple said that, you know, I've struggled, struggled, struggled. The wife says I waited only so that the kids settle, you know, before I take this step. So what, what do you think are the psychological factors that, you know, play a role there? I mean, we've seen even after 25 years of marriage, people file for divorce. So, Priya first and then Sheena, yeah. So when you're talking of uh, couples with 20 years of marriage, uh, 20 years behind them, you're essentially talking of the Gen X perhaps, you know, the uh, couples who were born in 70s or the 80s. This was, uh, these are marriages that came together even before the true impact of globalization, when there was no internet, no mobiles, no social media, etc. So uh, in this scenario, uh, one of the topmost reasons today, if these couples are going in for separation or uh, they're wanting to dissolve marriages, one of the topmost reasons, now this could be a trigger or this could be a cause or the mainstay, uh, is infidelity. Uh, inf- infidelity uh, was a reason back then. It continues to be so. The only difference is with this technology infusion, uh, it's found various avenues uh, on the digital medium. Um, of course, uh, there are other aspects to this as well, wherein there is a, uh, you know, friends with benefits and so on and so forth. There, there are various channels and various avenues here, but uh, digital medium is one of the topmost uh, avenues. This uh, gives them a solve for boredom. It doubles up as a feel good factor. There is refuge against abuse that they've, uh, you know, been bearing for these many years. So yes, in a nutshell, infidelity is one of the reasons, one of the mainstays across, whether it's 20 plus years or even new marriages, the reasons for uh, them are going in uh, for separation or falling apart. Uh, that, this, uh, that apart, uh, something that you just mentioned, li- living together, sticking it out for children or for social image. Yes, that's another one of the reasons why these marriages have lasted this far. And now that the kids have flown the nest or probably moved into universities and everything, these couples don't find it necessary anymore to go through the rigor of dealing with each other and putting up an act for the world. So yes, they take those calls now. 
uh financial professional failures could be another thing but and that could be something that they've been enduring all the while all along uh and up until such time that it's no more possible to uh you know deal with it or go with it and one of them decides to uh you know call the shots in the marriage or on the divorce um abusive relationships that have been held together just due to force of habit abusive could be mental physical emotional sexual financial any of them and this could be gender agnostic it could be either way uh they have been bearing the brunt of it for years for whatever reason maybe expecting things to remedify on their own or you know uh, things to just magically come together uh one fine day but it never happens and then finally at the fire end they decide that enough is enough and then we want to just you know uh, call it a day or pull the curtain down on the marriage untreated mental disorders <clears throat> something for, uh, in the indian context that, you know out in the west uh, there is more awareness there is more insight and these calls are taken a lot earlier uh than out here wherein uh, people do not firstly are they are not aware they don't believe in uh, you know mental health issues and they keep bearing uh, enduring these marriages uh with all the relatives and extended family trying to pitch in going to general physicians and doing everything circumventing uh all over but uh coming down uh, to mental health professionals uh for help and actually putting a finger to the problem uh that probably happens after 20 25 years that is now when there is a lot of awareness uh in the media and like a lot of bollywood personalities who've come out in the open with these problems and again so then they decide that enough is enough uh midlife crisis could be another aspect or uh, sexual orientation again uh never been addressed uh, never been open people have never come out and they are there today that could be another one of okay. uh, one of the reasons yeah. okay okay yes sheena please yes uh, adding on to ma'am uh, she is uh, nicely summed up everything uh, so just in addition that the psychological aspects are uh, trauma to the spouse uh, and who's been affected and the children and various uh, other stressors that are caused because the marriage didn't work but they were in the marriage for so long so what they have to do is now consider taking mental help and for mental health help for mental health so uh, now for them what is important is to understand uh, who is ready uh, to give them counseling and uh, what are the resources they have that are accessible for counseling and for any other uh, issues that they have faced so yeah so now for them the next challenge is going to be getting help for their mental health so i think uh, the psychological aspects are obviously seen but to treat them is necessary right well uh, i think that brings us to the end of this panel but before we go i would like you know all of you to sort of tell me in in one sentence probably that what a successful marriage means to you i mean and i think uh, start, we'll start with milan just one sentence each before we end the panel milan yeah okay right. so i think uh, it involves uh, commitment trust and sort of an uh need to uh, resolve issues that may come up during the marriage okay fabian uh, unmute, I'll, unmute i'll save ah, yeah. it for last i'll wrap up okay yes you. yes you will save us for the last okay uh, sagar yes sir uh, just in one line i would like to say that in the past uh, marriage was held uh, like a sacred thing where religious uh, sentiments were attached they say pati parmeshwar and bahu meri beti now it is more kind of a legal thing and a lot more kind of a business or the legal kind of thing that's why more divorces and that's why indian marriages are on fire thank you okay mezabin i think i think a successful marriage has to do with partners fully understanding themselves and appreciating their flaws and shortcomings and being able to compromise through it all so both the partners are human being human beings come with flaws and i think understanding that factor becomes the most crucial bit okay sheril So I think a successful marriage means a lot of work. Uh, it's not something which will happen very organically. You have to work on your marriage. I think on a day-to-day basis, it's not two halves joining together and you complete me. I know uh, Tom Cruise said it amazingly well in <laughs> the movie that you complete me, but nobody completes anybody. You two complete or maybe incomplete individuals getting together. So I think marriage is work. Yeah, Sheena. I think a successful marriage is where there is understanding and communication. 
Yep. Fordi jeg... Ja, du er en mute, en mute. Yeah. Successful marriage for not for the world but for both parties involved in the marriage. It would be love and trust, mm-hmm. and let familiarity breed contempt, not settle. So keep making efforts at rekindling. Okay, Kiran. I think lots of conversations to begin with, and um, an attitude that ask not what I get from the marriage but what I bring into the marriage. Good. Benaifa. I think in the moments of ah, when you want to kill them, you just remember the reason you fell in love with them in the first place. Right, Fabian, sum it up as you. So summing it up, we talked about the negative aspects as in fire, but because we are all mental health professionals and positivity is by default, this is what I want to decode fire as now on positive terms. F, friendship at the core. I, intimacy and much more. R. Reinforce the relationship time and time again, and E enhance each other. There's so much to gain. Keep that fire going. Right, open. right. Well, uh, well, very aptly put. And I think that brings us to the end of this panel. I mean, we could go on talking for hours on the topic, but uh, considering it's Sunday and we all have to, you know, rush off to all the things that we need to do. So I would like to thank all of you. I mean, for being here and making this panel a memorable one. and thank you good afternoon and have a great